I was actually, a, a, I've been a marketing person all my life. So um, it was actually a very interesting transition because my previous focus, before I had my midlife crisis and went back to school and got an MBA and now work in sustainability and consulting, uh, I was in performing arts marketing. And one of the things that's really interesting is how many similarities there are between explaining the value of opera or symphonic music to people and explaining the value of sustainability. So it's, it's actually really fascinating. I'm, there's, a, there's a dissertation there somewhere when I retire. But anyway, so I'm hoping to bring some of that experience to, to here to, to talk to you about. But I also, um, I want to say in all humility, you guys are experts on one of our primary topics tonight, which is Benicia. I don't know a whole lot about Benicia, so I'm looking forward to, to hearing about how some of these principles and the ideas that we're going to be talking about today can be applied. So that's where we are. And what are we going to be talking about tonight? Well, welcome and introduction. Da, da, da. So this is the first, this is the business case for sustainability workshop, the first of the six. So this is going to be a little bit more of a 30,000 feet kind of workshop. And some of you may be heartily bored. Yes, I know what the precautionary principle is. Shut up, woman. You know, that kind of thing that this may be very old hat to you. We will go through some terms. We'll talk about, about the sort of the larger view of sustainability. And uh, bear with me because we have some very good drill downs in the next five series, but we thought we'd better start with setting a baseline, which is what we do in sustainability anyway, right? We set a baseline, start measuring things where we are so we know what our progress is like. So we'll talk a little bit definitions, themes, principles, and then we're going to talk about how to make the case for sustainability because I think almost everyone in this room, and correct me if I'm wrong, as I'm sure you will, and I hope you will, um, everyone in this room believes in sustainable business practices to some extent, may not know the full picture, and may not be able to uh, verbalize or to explain those values to other people. Um, this is very, very, very common. Uh, and it's a real trick to be able to, not a trick, it's a, it's a, a skill that's something that you can develop, but it does take a while, so there are lots of things to think about, and there are lots of possible angles you can do to discuss it. Like, you know, opera, well, it's, it's a story about love. There are all kinds of different arguments that we'll be discussing today. Um, and then, I'm not going to sit up here and talk the whole time. You'll be delighted to hear. We'll do some group work. It might be a little challenging in this room, so I ask you to bear with me. Well, this is, uh, this is our first time in this room, first time with this workshop, so we'll be working through it. And appreciate your feedback, and maybe when we break up into groups, some of us might go outside so we can talk more easily. Okay, but we can work out that when we get to it. There will be a break in here somewhere, not to worry. And um, then I'm hoping that at the end, after we've done some case study discussion, we can come back and report back to our groups. This is a really canny way, actually, of avoiding giving you guys homework. Instead of sending you all home with five case studies that you have to report on, we're giving each group a case study that they will report back on so that everybody will know what we're talking about. Okay? Does that sound fair? Or would you rather do homework? No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, the experts are in this room, but I did do a little bit of research. That's me in Labor Day weekend at one of the bar and grills on First Street. I thought I, uh, Second Street, First Street? I thought I better, you know, just, just check it out. Just make sure I really understood Benicia deeply and profoundly, which I don't. But I have come, and, and it's absolutely charming. I'm enjoying it. So as I said, this is this, uh, the first uh, workshop in a series. And these are sort of the main threads that we study in the Green MBA, among other things. And they're all, one of our goals of the workshop series is to show you how all these things work together. Operations, metrics, marketing, um, the power of more in times of less. Is there anybody who feels like totally abundant and they have enough money for everything they want to do? Yeah, no, I didn't think so. Me either. So it's how, how we can work with that in a systemic way. And then at the end, hopefully, um, each of you will have a sort of action plan for yourself, for your organization, of what you would like to implement, what your primary goals are. So an, a real, like a real marketing plan for my personal business. To that end, to that end, and I'm from the East Coast, so I tend to speak quickly, but I will try to remember to pause every now and then so that everybody has a chance to sit quietly and think about what does all this mean to me. And I encourage you, if I don't, say, stop it for a minute, let me think. 
Um, and so we'll sit for a while and, and just make some notes to yourself so that you have almost like a journal of the, through these, going through these six workshops, because there's two weeks in between, things will occur to you, and if you s get in the habit now of making notes either on your computer, whatever, whatever works for you, you can draw it, um, it, I think it will help you at the end and you'll go back and realize the, the path that you come along, and that's also a very sustainable thing. This is a graduate level class, basically. So that means that I am not up here spewing my knowledge at you and you're taking furious notes and preparing for the quiz, okay? This is not that. This is, I will make some suggestions, I will tell some stories, I will, you know, go over some principles, and you are free, I encourage you, I'm that kind of person too, to question what I'm saying, to say, but what about, or that doesn't sound right, or are you sure, and I'll probably say, no, I'm not sure. This is how I see things, this is my perspective, but whatever. So I just wanted you to feel empowered, and we will have breaks for discussion, but if there's something that's burning you up and you just can't move on and you've got to express it, I encourage you to you know, say, hey, what about? Because I could misspeak, too. I do it occasionally. I try not to, but I do. Okay? So. What are those pictures? Oh, these are all Benicia pictures. These are all Benicia pictures. That's actually a whale in the Sacramento River, I believe. And um, yeah, so there's all, all pictures of Benicia that I've been collecting. I can't see them yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, here's our the wonderful community garden here. I, I took the picture of after I had the beer, so it might be a little bit. <laughs> um, that's uh, the map of uh, the earthquake fault zone. Risks. Risk management is an important factor in sustainability. This is the. I think it, is it a farmers market or an antiques market? I can't really tell. There's Okay, and Valero, and this is actually Benicia in 1850-something, so we'll get to that uh, shortly, but thank you for reminding me. So she's my cue lady. She has, she's, I'm surprised she doesn't, she has a little cane if I talk too much, too, so. All right, so moving on, the uh, first part, we're just going to talk about sustainability in general. And I will just do a commercial for this, uh, this uh, image. You can't tell what it is too well. This is, a, a, this is actually an award-winning advertisement out of China. And I don't know if you're aware of the fact that Pe Pe Beijing actually has a license plate lottery. They are trying to limit, they have limited the numbers of cars so much that they have to hold a lottery every year. And, you know, thousands and thousands of people entered to, to have the right to have a car. And they're, because this is what they're trying to do for their smart growth. So Lord knows they have, they have issues too. But the issue, the, 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 the um, impetus of this is actually almost like a piece of art. It's, a it's at a crosswalk. And people crossing the street put their, put their feet into this non-toxic green paint and they walk across what was a drawing of a blank tree with no branches. And the message that they're getting across to people is that by walking instead of driving, you are creating leaves on the tree, which I think is very, it was won all kinds of awards. It's just a very beautiful thing and it's been replicated all over the, all over the country. I just had to put that in. I put a lot of art stuff in, forgive me. <laughs> it's just my thing. But why should we do sustainable business? Well, um, there's no business on a dead planet, right? So you, there are, you, we can go on to the scary, the scary stuff, and I won't spend too much time on sea level rise and all that kind of stuff. I'm assuming you know it. If not, we can go over it at a, at a different time. But um, I want to talk a little bit more about why I use the term, or how we use the term sustainability versus green. Uh, I think green has, uh, there, you know, it, it's all good shorthand. Oh, it's green. You know, that's fine. It's good. You know it's cle clean and healthy or whatever. Um, but sustainability is more about some of the themes that we're going to be looking at. It's about long-term thinking. And it, if you go back to the definition, the original word, what does to sustain means? It comes from the Latin through the French for holding up from underneath as a support, okay? So sustainability is actually a way of supporting you as you move forward in English. Because <laughs> a few months ago, I had the pleasure of talking about systems thinking to a group of Thai Green MBA students. It was very interesting. And I asked them, well, what's the Thai word for sustainable? And they said the word, which I won't even try to, to repeat. And I said, well, what does it mean? And they said it means balanced. It means balanced. So that's another way to think about sustainability that I think is more helpful than just saying green, because green you immediately think of trees, and that makes you think cities bad, trees good, and then you're instantly in that dichotomy where, you know, good, bad, black, white, evil, good, and which is not what sustainability is about, I think. Again, feel free to fight me. So um, 
as I said, we know we have all kinds of issues that we're dealing with, and we also know, I hope, or we'll see as we move forward, that many of the issues, pollution, economic hardship, population, problem of waste, regulation, climate change, are very much interconnected. And a helpful way, we will delve into this a little bit more in, in another uh, of the workshops, but a helpful well way to think about your business is that your business is sitting within a circle of society, of human activity, which is in turn sitting within the circle of the environment. I know this seems very basic and obvious to some of you, but a few decades ago, those outer circles would have been reversed. Right? And in some, in some cases, it's still, they still are in some people's minds. We are here to, to take, take hold of nature, use nature, take out of it what we need, and then you know, the rest can just go for whatever. But I think we'll see that our businesses truly do function within the systems of society, which functions within the system of the environment. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. So again, I just wanted to show the difference between Benicia 100 and whatever years ago and Benicia today. A few more people. Um, does anybody know the population of the Earth? Yeah, seven billion, right? This month, this month, maybe next month, the seven billionth human being is going to be born, probably in India. Okay, so we are dealing with population challenges. So we've got 27,000 here, we're doing pretty well. But there's still, because we are all interrelated, all of that growth, all of, those, all of that activity is going to make a difference to how we live. Okay, so what is a sustainable business? Just want to introduce some of the themes that sort of, if you're, if you're examining a business, say, well, what are they talking about? What are they thinking about? How are they acting? Is it clear to you that they are thinking on a longer time horizon? We all have quarterly reports, monthly financial statements, uh, bills that are due, the roof is leaking, oh my gosh, I gotta take care of this, 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 now, 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 now. But I think, and again, you can argue with me, but I think we are finally realizing that that short-term thinking is what has gotten to us into a lot of the problems that we're in today, particularly in terms of pollution, waste, and also economy, right? Also economy, the grabbing the short-term profits rather than looking longer term uh, and letting the future take care of itself can be an iffy, an iffy thing to do. A conscious business, a sustainable business, has consciously drawn their boundaries. They've thought about where their business ends, where it begins and where it ends. So does your business end at your front door? Does your business end at point of sale? Does your business end when, or does it begin when the first things come into your, the first supplies come in from your vendors? Where does your business begin and end? And if you think about the effects that that will have, it tends to give you a larger boundary for your business. And that will make you into a more sustainable business in the long term. A sustainable business uses metrics, measures. Okay? We'll talk a lot more about that in another workshop series. But it's very pretty crucial to measure. But it's the interesting pitfall that a lot of businesses fall into, or, and people for that matter, is they measure things just because they can measure them and not necessarily because they're the things that matter. So we'll try to talk a little bit about that, of what, what are the frameworks that help us determine what, what are the measurements that really matter, as opposed to just say, well, I can count this, so obviously if it goes, if, it's, if, it goes, if I had seven and now I have eight, that's good. You know, so that's kind of a, a linear thing that we will, we will challenge. A, sus a sustainable business understands that change is the only certainty. Change is the only certainty. So that... Um, <laughs> Often, and, and, and environmentalists, guilty as charged, we can, oh, if only we could go back to that time where we all smelled the flowers and ate organic food and died at 40. You know, there are all kinds of ways, this idea that there's this Arcadian steady state that we can move back to and everything will be fine is, is actually counterproductive in the attempt to become sustainable. It's not really effective. This idea to this recreation of the past, of that you know, beautiful day when we were all skipping mightily down the green fields and, and breathing clean air. Um, I think that if we think long enough about it, we'll realize, well, there were some downsides to that, you know, saber-toothed tigers and whatever. So. And the other main thing that, that sort of brings a sustainable business to the fore is the idea that they're not waiting to be told what to do. 
They're thinking long term, they're examining their challenges, and they're reacting. And I, uh, this is a, a, a late, late breaking slide, so I might have to read some of the quotes to you because I haven't memorized it. But the Carbon Disclosure Project uh, just came out with their, their annual report today. And the top statistic is 396 of the 500 largest global companies, so we're talking the big guys now, put climate change central to their business. Why? Is it because they love polar bears? They may love polar bears, but that's not why they put it central to their business. Rising oil prices, risky energy supplies, and a growing recognition of the returns on investment in cutting emissions. Okay? And those were the, those were the, the primary um, statistics that the, that the companies themselves came up to. And if you'll forgive me, I'd just like to read a couple more. 59% of companies reported that the cost of schemes to reduce emissions, such as energy saving projects in buildings, installing low carbon power, and changing the behavior of staff were recouped within three years. So that return on investment was recouped in three years. That's 59% of, of the companies reported that. Almost three quarters of the businesses who responded to the survey now have emissions reductions targets, emission reduction targets, sorry, that's hard to say three times, up from two thirds just a year before. So from two thirds to three quarters of the business responding in just a year. And an analysis of the carbon performance leaders, so they're really the creme de la creme of good, good um, sustainable business leaders, generated an 86% financial return against a 43% average for all 500 of the companies. So they were sustainable and they have doubled their, revenue, their, their financial health while being sustainable. Now, I want to step back for a moment. Just because you're a sustainable company doesn't mean you're instantly guaranteed to be a fi uh, financial genius, okay? Causation is not correlation. It may be that because a company is forward thinking, thinks in the long term, thinks the big picture, and prepares for risk management, that that makes them a better uh, financial investment and that makes them a better company. It may not be because they are quote unquote sustainable with a big super S in front of them, okay? But there is something about that correlation that seems to be playing out here. Okay, so that's the Carbon, di carbon uh, Disclosure Project, Global Project. I have a question. Yes. The 104 companies, is there a certain part of the um, globe that those companies are in? Uh, they're from all over. Um, I know that the headline today was that two that did not respond was Apple and Warren Buffett's um, company, yeah. So um, yes, they are, they're, but they are they are distributed all over. And there are some American companies in the forefront, and but there are many, many that are not. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's a geographic. Um, yes. Um, is there a statistical breakdown of what I guess the companies would call why are they are exactly um, uh, how that investment is specific to that percentage? Yeah, you know. It's a very good question. I don't know. They're, yes, I think they have they have a whole series that they have like a whole database that they crunch, and I don't know how it correlates to to uh, a financial statement. It's a very good question. It's a very good question. And again, I'm not saying that that's absolute proof that sustainable companies always make more money, but there's some good evidence that they do. And the link to this is where. Yeah. Uh, we'll send we'll send this out when we do the whole part. Actually, frankly. If you just go online right now, everybody is talking about this. It was the breaking news story this morning. So <laughs> as I said, new, new data. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. OK. So assuming that you've become a, uh, a th so the other, the other assumption is that you just it, being a sustainable business doesn't mean that you suddenly start doing everything sustainably all at once. There is sort of a, uh, this is one person's model of a, like, almost like a funnel of sustainable behavior. The stages that a company goes through in going down the path to sustainability. And notice that I say the path to sustainability, there is no peak. You don't get to the peak, say, okay, that's it, I'm sustainable, I don't have to do anything anymore. That's another sort of misconception. There is no on-off switch for being sustainable. The each, each step is sort of an incremental step down the path. It's either on the, in the sustainable direction or the unsustainable direction. But there's no end point. Okay? And this is also something that's really hard for some people to, to, to be comfortable with. It's like, okay, I want to get there. You know, well, it's just not quite that 
It's not quite that obvious. And there's a step before that. There's a poor compliance is an opportunity. There's a set of businesses that just can't get this in the gear because there's not enough hours to train them over. Right. 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 So these are, this is a, 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 I think a really excellent article. And again, we'll send out this, a link to this. I, I highly advise everybody, you, you can sign up for free at Harvard Business Review and get like three articles for free a month. So it's, it's a good deal because I'm not going gonna, gonna, gonna to pay them. But you can get this wonderful article. And it, um, it, it, again, it gives these sort of five stages of, of passing through sustainability uh, on, on the path to it. The first one is to see compliance, compliance basically to regulations as, as sort of uh, a baseline, not your finish line, right? Compliance is an opportunity, and the biggest opportunity is to get there, is to comply before you have to. Right? So we'll, give, we'll talk about some examples of this, but there are many, many. Um, I think the example in the article was that um, the company HP realized back in the 80s that lead was not so good to have in their products and that w it was eventually going to be regulated. So they started preparing in the 80s and then in 96, I think it was, when, for instance, the EU outlawed it in their electronic devices, they were already there. They had had 14, 15 years to prepare. They were prepared and they were compliant from day one of that law going into effect. Whereas if you just, well, if I just be, stay back here, be very quiet, wait till the law, you know, maybe it won't happen. That kind of denial will, has left a lot of companies in the dust, actually. It's, 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 uh, it's an unhelpful way. So compliance as opportunity and pre-compliance is even more of an opportunity. So you've, you've, you've accepted that compliance to the regulations is, is, a, is a good thing and beyond. Then you might want to look about, and this is again, the borders, the boundaries of your business, making your value chain sustainable. And can anybody tell me, uh, well, there, there are probably many good examples of a company that has done this. There's a very famous one right now. Does anybody know? Some really involved with making, uh, helping their suppliers and vendors become more sustainable? Walmart. 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 And it's had huge ripple effects because obviously they're huge. So <laughs> if you can get that leverage point going, you're in good shape. And so looking at your value chain, looking at this, the chain of what your inputs and outputs, where, where can you make those more sustainable? Then the next step, and these steps are, you know, this is one of, this is, my, this is my thing with Harvard. They have to make everything into these little lines. And it's not a linear process. But there are another phase might be to design sustainable products and services that appeal to the quote unquote green consumer. The green consumer is basically 60%, depending on how you define it, is basically 60% of the US population, you know, light green, dark green, whatever. Um, but, <laughs> but there are even more people concerned with, for instance, the health of their children. Right? So there are ways to say, well, how can I design my products to be acceptable to, uh, you know, or, or to beat the other guys into, into something that is um, more valuable. Then another step might be to develop new business models. New business models. So you're in the same sort of business, but you are using less material. You, are, you have redesigned your processes in a way that do, not, um, that do not harm the environment or do not harm people. And then at the end of the, of the, sh the chain, in their opinion, is the game-changing ones, the, pe the things that sort of, oh, we're all going to be on the smart grid in five years that absolutely change how society and, and, uh, d does things. So we won't worry about those in Benicia today. But that is, there are, there are ways, there are businesses that are working towards absolutely changing the way um, we do all kinds of everyday things. If you think about a few years ago, you know, there were record stores, there were travel agents, there were bookstores. Uh, you know, I think the next thing might be banks. I think we might be seeing, you know, community banks, or, you know, the, the sort of bank on every corner thing. That might not be such, such a common thing. So I don't know, but I don't know. I'm not a futurist, so we'll see. So there is this funnel of activities that can, that can, uh, De denote a, a sustainable business. Yes. It's the emphasis on the financial bottom line. It's very, the financial bottom line is key. Okay. It's crucial. There's no getting around that, you know, I'm going to, you know, uh, produce this fabulous product and it'll be great, but oh, wait, I'm not, I haven't really balanced my assets and uh, oh, wait, oh, I'm out of business. Okay. So that's not, I'm not, I'm not here to advocate for that. But there are other forms of capital that perhaps need to be considered in balance. And this is might would be where we get to considering systemic changes around how we account for a business success, which again is not something we can do here today. 
but that there are other ways, there are other things. There's, your, there's financial capital, there's your effect on natural capital, there's the engineered capital that you create, there's the human capital when your employees become educated or become included in decision-making processes, and there's the social capital which is built when you have a lot of successful, sustainable businesses in a group, they make a better society. So it's just a different way of thinking. And again, it's more balancing that rather than saying it's one or the other or this more, or I need to be 30% this and 20% that. Then there is the almighty corporation of all time, which is Nature Inc. Nature Inc, is, this is just sort of to go into a little bit the goods and services that nature provides us. Again, I think maybe everybody in this room knows this, but it doesn't hurt to remind people every now and again when you wonder if am I in that circle outside of the environment or am I underneath it, to go through this list and think where would we be if, if these, when these systems are out of balance, when these products, when these goods and services are not available to us, we tend to get into a little bit of trouble, right? It sounds like everybody in the room is more or less up to speed with all this, so I won't spend a lot of time. Photosynthesis, 132 billion tons of net plant production per year, and that's just on land. So, and they, don't, they haven't even done the calculation for what's under the sea. So, a big product. But plant and animal products, obviously, textiles, food, et cetera, and also medicine. Lots and lots of uh, medicine to be discovered still in, in the species that we, that we haven't even explored to the full. Pollination, vast, vast tracts of agriculture wouldn't exist without our friends, the pollinators, the bees. They, cl it cleans the, they clean the air, purifies the water, mitigates floods, controls erosion, detoxifies pollutants. This is the, the concept of bioremediation, right? That, um, for instance, fungi can, can take toxins out of the ground and, and can actually clean the, the area of, hard, of um, hard metals, that kind of thing. There is an interesting uh, experiment or effort underway right now in Japan in, near Fukushima to plant sunflowers because sunflowers concentrate nuclear waste you then can remove the sunflowers. You have to treat them as nuclear waste. You have to dispose of them properly, but it is a way of getting that radiation out of the soil in a way that, that, is, that is manageable without tons of chemicals and all kinds of other things. So that's a very important one that not everybody is aware of. Uh, detoxifying, controlling pests and disease naturally as opposed to with, with synthetic chemicals, which have their own knock-on effects and regulating climate, not just for cl you know, climate change, weather patterns, all that kind of thing. So, Thank you, Nature Incorporated. You've done a good job, and it's our, it's our work to recognize that and understand the effects that our businesses would have on this very valuable partner in business. I right? just wanted to mention that there are frameworks out there. There are, other frame, there are several frameworks out in the world that help people think about their business sustainably at all different levels. One of them that I'm very fond of is called the Natural Step. How many people have heard of the Natural Step? It's, it's actually not very well known in the United States. It's much more, it's more accepted all over the world. Um, just briefly, it was, um, it's an interesting story. It was originated by a, a man called Carl Henrik Robert, a Swedish doctor who was a cancer doctor for children, a pediatric uh, cancer uh, doctor. And he was struck when he saw caregivers from all levels, the, from the healthcare people to the family members to everything, coming together around consensus around their priority is we have to care for these children. And then, so he started to think about, well, what, what, how do you get to consensus? What do you do with consensus? And then he was studying, he was looking at cells through his microscope, and he started to think, well, there are some basic sort of principles around how cells function that kind of everybody agrees on. And wouldn't it be nice if we could come to some sort of consensus on how, how all of our activities need to work in the world so that we can evaluate every action, every decision we make based on these four principles. So these are the four principles that he came up after, oh, I, you know, 17 years and a lot of, consul he's very Swedish, he very talked to a lot of people, very, very uh, dialogue oriented, it was excellent, good idea. Um, and so the natural step is actually a framework that is used by, um, it's used by cities, it's used by businesses, it's used by nonprofits. Um, so it's a, a framework that can be applied across the board, which is something that's very, very handy um, for, very, it's a very good sustainable approach to not get too siloed into your sector or your, your um, particular need. 
So, um, oh, and there's a nifty natural step two minute video that we'll also send you the link to. It's, it's on my computer, but it, you wouldn't be able to hear it very well, so I don't want to do that. Anyway, he came up with these four principles, and underneath I've just put some, um, defin some, some terms that we might want to talk about very briefly. I don't want to spend too much time on them. But reduced dependence on fossil fuels, I think we kind of all know where that's going. It's based on the concept that uh, even if it didn't harm the atmosphere, we are sort of eventually going to run out of oil because it is a finite resource. Peak oil is, is, uh, is either has happened, is about to happen, will happen in the future, but it's going to happen at some point. Um, so what is the difference between finite resources, renewable resources, and how many demands can our planet take uh, up to a certain point. So what's the carrying capacity of this planet? Um, and I just want to say as a side issue that some things that uh, I, I blog a lot for uh, an, a, a large network of, uh, it's called care2.com, and I try to talk about sustainability issues for the general public. And every time I talk about any, almost any issue, somebody says there are too many people in the world. If we just could control overpopulation, everything would be fine. And, um, you know, yes, there are a lot of people in the world that has a lot of problems, that puts a lot of pressure on the planet, but the, the statistic I always go back with is that, yeah, well, Americans are 4% of the world's population and we use 25% of the resources. So is it really the extra baby in Bangladesh that's the problem here? Okay, so th these, are, these are some of the, 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 you know, the back and forth that you will, you will come across when you're explaining sustainability or, or trying to talk, to talk about it. The second principle is reduced dependence on synthetic chemicals that persist in nature. It means that they don't go away, they sort of build up and stay there. It's not a good thing. They tend to build up in all our systems. Um, and that brings, brings us to the precautionary principle. Can anybody define the precautionary principle? When you bring that to a business level, it basically means that if you're employing the precautionary principle, you, you have to uh, prove something is safe. Right, you, do, you can't prove that it, it, it is not, right? So that, yeah, so exactly, so, as I won't, <laughs> oh, come on, exactly. So you have to employ the precautionary principle and assume that something is, 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 you have to assume it's dangerous until proven otherwise, okay? Reduced destruction of nature, we talked about ecosystem services, by the importance of biodiversity, we're losing many, many species a day that may have all kinds of benefits for people in business and not to mention they're cool, and carbon sequestration, the, the, the um, concept that, that carbon that is, the, that is creating global warming can be uh, sequestered in the ground and kept out of it by, by various uh, natural processes that we are harming, obviously, by burning down the rainforest and various other things. Ensure that we are not stopping people globally from meeting their needs, which gets back to your, your point, right? And uh, so this gets into questions of consumption level, equity, carbon and water footprint, and environmental and social justice. And one of the issues that we see a lot for, with green organizations is that the environmentalists are often fighting with the environmental justice people, right? So, uh, you know, the factories need, to, you know, we need factories for jobs, but then they cause asthma, and then, you know, but you need poor people to be helped, and there's all kinds of, and, and it is, you know, statistically proved that, uh, in general, uh, you know, spewing out factories are cited in places that are poor because they have less political pl pl power to say no, move away, right? So there's just all kinds of issues around that. So again, let's, I just, I'll just keep coming back to some possible ways of framing why you want to be a sustainable business. You want to be a resilient business because you know that change is the only certainty, right? So you want to manage risk because change is all about risk. So you want to be able to manage that. You want to increase your revenue and or control costs, right? I think most businesses would be interested in doing that and sustainability can help you. And it is also, as we talked about in getting ahead of, of, of regulation, market leadership and competitive advantage. And I just want to say that the competitive advantage is not just about your product. It can be about the quality of your, of your staff, right? And the quality of, of, of your, of your uh, uh, standing, your reputation in the industry. So it's not just about a bottom line money thing. So that was a quick view through basic principles, arguments, counter arguments uh, of why a business would want to be sustainable. We'll look at some more specifics and a particular case study in the next half of the class, but I wanted to pause 
I think give you guys a break, but I wanted to see if there are any questions or statements before we break for a few minutes. An effective sustainability approach creates efficiencies, saves costs, and helps generate additional revenue. Sure sounds like the financial bottom line to me. And that was spoken by David Stubbs, who's the head of sustainability for the London 2012 Olympics. Uh, it's a really amazing case study that um, one of our groups actually is going to be talking about in their group and then presenting to us a, bit, a little bit later. So uh, some good examples there. So. We've talked a little bit about some of the arguments and some of the things that you've heard. Like, I'm against it. I'm against it. It costs too much. We've been examining case studies that say the return on investment, as we said, people recouping their investment in three years, that sort of thing. It doesn't matter. Sustainability doesn't matter. That's kind of a personality thing that we'll have to talk to, talk to people about. I would have to change. And of course, the, the sort of standard repost to that is that change is the only thing that certain, something's going to have to change we, we, just don't, we just don't know which way it might, may go. Things are just fine the way we are. That to me might say that people are drawing the boundaries of their organization a little too narrowly, but I could be wrong. Uh, it won't make a difference. This is a really important one. Uh, my, I'm just one little piece of person in this huge, great big world. What I do doesn't matter, therefore I'm going to buy a Hummer or whatever, nothing against Hummers, whatever. But you know what I mean? <laughs> well, actually, I do. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> uh, it won't make a difference. Um, that's, and, and there's the, 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 the typical sort of kumbaya, every, every little action makes a difference, but actually every little action does make a difference because that's how you get to a tipping point. You know, it's like those, those microbes in a Petri dish right? You get the, so it doubles every day, it doubles every day. So if you get to 50% of the petri dish, how much of the dish is covered next day? The whole thing, the whole thing right? Oh, such a good class. <laughs> so yes, it, little, it does make a difference. It does make a difference if you believe it. And then regulation is strangling us, which is something we hear a lot. And it's, um, it, there are a lot of interesting case studies that show, and we'll get into this a little bit, long, long, uh, little bit later, that regulation has been a real spur to innovation, a real spur to, to financial and, and, uh, and other kinds of success, and has led to betterment, to uh, both financial and uh, environmental betterment. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. One of the things, and again, this is again back to the sort of regulation argument that you'll hear a lot. Regulations are killing us. Regulations are, are bad. They're always bad. We need unfettered business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one of the ways to talk about that is um, to ask, what kind of business are you? What kind of business are you? Are you, for instance, and this is a, an extreme example, are you a buggy whip maker? Or are you a velocity accelerator company? Okay, how do you think of yourselves? And um, so does anybody know what this is about? And it's kind of hard to see. What's in, those, what's in that bin? Phone books. Yellow pages, phone books, phone books, right? So in San Francisco, and I know Sacramento, they're trying to do it now, they, have, they are um, in the process of regulating the yellow pages because San Francisco found out that 25% of their paper waste was yellow pages being discarded. And they said, you know, really, this is not a cool thing because people get them in and they were sorry. So, they, so yes, they have now regulated the yellow pages. Well, if the yellow pages had thought of themselves, and I'm just positing this, if the yellow pages had thought of themselves, well, what do I do really? Is it really about this yellow paper that I de de deliver all over the city? Or is it about the information that's actually on the yellow paper that people need and that they still need and that there, there, maybe there was some way I could have shifted my business model to still purvey the, provide this service in a way that was not going to be regulated and was not going to use the maximum uh, materials and get stuck in a bin, you know, and, and account for 25% of the waste. So that waste you know, the Yellow Pages didn't pay for that to get, get, to get picked up. The citizens of San Francisco paid for that to get recycled, et cetera. So that's one of the, one of the I think it's a really clear, simple example of what kind, what kind of business are you really in? And maybe there are ways of continuing to provide that goods and service that doesn't necessarily require the same amount of resource intensity. Okay? So that's just a very simple example that I think um, can work. Some very, very big businesses get it. I'm sorry this is such a hard picture to read. This is actually the U.S. Army uh, installing solar panels. The, Uni the United States Armed Forces are some of the major uh, pioneers in large-scale sustainability efforts. Why? Is it because they love trees? 
No, it's because their job is to protect the country and to protect national security, and they have done, paid a lot of attention to, oh, climate refugees, climate, you know, uh, all these changes coming down the pike, we better be ready. Peak oil, ee, that doesn't sound good, that could lead to war. People fight over resources. So what can we do to be prepared around that? So um, some very good examples coming out of the military. Yes. There's another really, really big business that's paying attention to sustainability. Again, not from the bottom, from the depths of their heart, but because they know it will save them money and make them more efficient, and that is the U.S. government. And I put up these, there are actually seven, well, um, there are two slides worth of these, not because I think the U.S. government does everything right, but because this is a really nice checklist that any business can use to say how far, am, how am I doing on the sustainability front? And I just, just very briefly, energy efficiency, okay, I'll look at that. Measure, reduce, and report greenhouse gas emissions. Corporations at AB 32, we're about to all be required to do that, right? Conserve and protect water resources, pretty key in California. Eliminate waste, recycle and prevent pollution, good idea. Leverage agency acquisitions to foster markets for sustainable technologies and environmentally preferable materials, products, and services. Looking at my supply chain, what's coming down the pike? Uh, this continues on. Design, construct, maintain, and operate high-performance, sustainable buildings. Buildings account for a lot of, of uh, waste and greenhouse gas emissions, so this is a, a huge area to look at, and the, and the U.S. government owns a whole lot of buildings, so they need to be very careful about that. I love these last two because it gets back into the social capital, into the people-centered view of sustainability. Strengthen the vitality and livability of the communities in which federal facilities are located, and very important, inform federal employees about and involve them in the achievement of these goals. So inclusion of staff in all, at all levels in sustainability decisions. I think it's a really nice list that can be applied to just about any, you know, a corner store on up. So um, this was Executive Order 13514 from October 2009, and I'm not sure how they're doing. I'm not saying they're doing it all, but the intention is there, and hopefully there will be some accountability for that. So I just wanted to put that out there for you. And then we wanted to talk a little bit more about regulations, segueing on from the government and how all regulations are, are un, uh, you know, can be, uh, are, can be viewed as bad, or it's, you know, that's sort of one of the current ideas. Um, there have been documentations, and this is what some of the things that we were talking about that Sarah was mentioning before, with a regulation like REACH and ROSE, the uh, Registration, Evaluation, and Approval or Authorization of Chemicals Act in, the, in, the, in, uh, in Europe, the um, uh, we the, the rules regulations around uh, e-waste, around chemicals, around hazardous substances. It has been documented that the number of patent applications has actually exploded after those rules started coming down the pike in Europe because people said, oh my gosh, we better go out and innovate and find something else to do, so something that's better, something that doesn't use these harmful materials that we know are going to be banned. So this has been documented. It also, regulations also provide a level playing field, which is kind of the flip side of getting out ahead of the regulations to keep your competitive advantage. Um, it, it, if you, it makes everybody comply at least at a baseline so that you have somewhere to start. And also, the other, one of the other sort of accepted myths is that, oh, well, regulations are killing small businesses. And this is the results of a recent McClatchy survey of small businesses across the country. Small business owners cite access to credit as the main hurdle for their financial um, um, success and stability, stability, not regulations and not tax burden. Now that's just one survey, I'm not saying it's all right, but I'm just saying that there's, yeah. Who knows who this man is? Ray Anderson, who's Ray Anderson? Interface, right. Yay, yay. Ray passed away uh, this, this month, last month, not long ago. And um, he is the original uh, sort of see the light messiah guy. I figured it out. Oops, I was occupied in a very profoundly petroleum dependent polluting industry, in his case, the carpet industry, which is all based on petroleum products and spews out chemicals and all various kinds of things. And he read a book called The Ecology of Commerce by Paul Hawken. 
And um, we, it's going to be on the resource list, don't worry about it. <laughs> but um, there are also some wonderful videos of Ray speaking because he was a, a really super charming man. He was a southerner, a uh, lovely accent, and just he just said, you know, I was a plunderer of the earth, and that's not the legacy one wants to leave behind. And legacy is actually another really good um, discussion point when you're trying to move a business towards sustainability, particularly a really successful one. It's like, okay, you've been the CEO, you've brought this thing up to, Interface is now a billion dollar company from, they were in the hole $400,000 when he started. So what, what do you want to leave? And that's, that is an argument for sustainability that often works with people. You know, look at your kids. We, we had a, a meeting not long ago and we said, well, you know, we need a baby in the boardroom program. We need to have a, a baby that sort of sits on the, on, the, on the table for every board meeting and that you have to look at that baby when you're making your decisions because that, <laughs> what you're deciding is gonna, hurt, is gonna affect that kid. You know, that's the kind of um, messaging that might work with some people and not with others, so anyway. Yes, he just died. And I have to tell you this, I wrote an obituary, uh, an appreciation of Ray Anderson, and this is just so interface. I wrote it on, on care2.com, and I didn't think any of that. I, I blogged you know, three times a week because I wrote sent it out, and got some nice, and very nice remarks. A lot of people had never heard of him, so that was very gratifying to me that I was able to introduce this man to so many people. And um, Monday, I received an email from the interface marketing department thanking me for my appreciation of, the, of, of, of Ray Anderson. So I think one of the best arguments is the sustainablest companies are also the classiest. Yes. <laughs> that was real, that has never happened to me before. Need to move on. And I think one of the most interesting definitions that I've seen of waste, which is what interface uses, I mean, they really use it, they report on their waste as any cost which does not produce value to the customer. So that's, that, can, that can be a very, it's a very broad definition that is extremely useful and that they have quantified with great detail. And they found out as they embarked on their sustainability journey that 10% um, of each of sales dollar went to waste. 10% of each, so that they calculated that by eliminating the waste, and by waste they meant like, uh, you know, remnants and remains. It's, it was a, very much a material kind of waste because the way carpets were made um, was, was very wasteful at the time. Um, it re represented 28% of its operating income. So they, they, have, they really made some redesign of their processes. They actually, I th I'm pretty sure that this carpet is interface carpet. And it's also <laughs> exactly. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so um, I'm going to skate a little bit faster over this. These were, these were some of the, 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 the savings over the amount of time that he, he actually sort of seriously became involved in it in the mid-90s and was able to turn the company around um, with some very good results. So there are opportunities out there for business uh, moving into the sustainability, and this is another you know, sort of thing that we can start talking about. There was $400 billion worth of private investment that went into green technology in the first seven months of 2011, despite the economy, so that there are some opportunities. There is some funding available from Small Business Administration loans, et cetera. I'm not saying they're easy to get, but there are, they, are, they are working on it, and hopefully some other new programs will be coming in down the line. The other opportunities to get ahead of the curve, uh, as we talked about in terms of competitiveness, and also, and this is more the case with larger companies, but if you work with larger companies, this will start to become an issue, shareholder pressure and resolutions. Uh, people who own stock in the company were saying, listen, you've got to pay a little bit more attention to your effect on the environment and, and on people's health in your products. So these are other opportunities slash challenges to, for becoming a sustainable business. This is from the magazine, it's based in Britain, called Ethical Corporation, also from just from this month, but I think it was a very nice, this was a, a result of a survey that this author did and the, a, about the key benefits from companies who are doing it. What do they call the key benefits of going, of sustainability? Brand value and reputation, which is very important, something we'll talk about more in marketing. Employees and future workforce. Uh, Attracting and retaining top talent is a very expensive thing if, you're, if you, uh, uh, you need, especially for skilled, for skilled um, uh, labor. Up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Operational effectiveness, this is what we talked about in terms of, of refining your processes, redefining, redesigning what you do. Risk management, very important. 
Direct financial impact came down at number five, but that's okay. They're still, they, they are, people are self-selecting. They're saying, yes, we have seen the direct financial benefit of, go, of going for sustainability initiatives. Organizational growth, very important for your competitive um, advantage. And business opportunities, mostly with partnerships. Just uh, to reiterate the people, profit, and planet advantages, 55% of companies with sustainability programs report improved employee morale. There are various other statistics around employee retention and attraction. Um, and attraction and retention and morale lead to employee creativity, which is a, a very good social capital asset that's not to be disdained. Profit, I think we've talked a little bit about sustainability can be help businesses become more efficient and leading to cost savings. This is what we'll be looking at in the case studies that we're going to look at just now where it's very clearly quantified, that return on investment from something as simple as a lighting retrofit, pallet recycling, or using a routing software. Um, this is their changing lighting there. And planet, reduced dependence on resources and on fossil fuels improves risk management and exposure to price fluctuations because we know that price, the price of energy is, is a huge burden on a lot of businesses. Right? What is that a picture of? That is, um, I hate to tell you, yeah, that, that was a, 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 a Chinese pipeline uh, that um, broke apart and that guy, he was rescued, he's okay, but that was basically oil slicked ocean that he was floating around in. How do you sustainabilize a business? That's not a word, I made it up. Um, this is something that I just want to suggest to you that there are multiple ways that this can happen. Sometimes, as with interface, it comes from a leader saying, oh my gosh, I better step up to the plate and lead. Sometimes it comes from a different kind of leader, somebody within the organization or a group of people within the organizations that say, we need to make this a better place. They form green teams and try to um, you know, sell up, as it were. Um, they, the uh, approach to the important thing is the bottom line or the uh, approach to broadening your view of what the bottom line actually is. And as that radical left-wing newspaper, the Financial Times, says it, I'm kidding, it's very, uh, very right-wing, addressing social and environmental concerns is becoming part of mainstream business. So it's not just me saying it, it is the Financial Times. I just wanted to leave this final quote, which is one of the best... Uh, arguments, if you will, for why are you working, and a lot of people say, oh, well, business, they're the enemy, they're the whatever. That's, business is a primary leverage point for change in this, in this world, in the world that we live on. In, in some cases, it's got the most primacy and the most power of any state, any organization, more than government, more than, than, uh, than religion used to have in the medieval period. There, it's a real prime leverage for change. And that's why focusing on sustainable business can be the most effective way that we can make the, the, the world a better place for people and, and for the planet. So I just wanted to emphasize, because I think this is a great, he's talking about the climate crisis in this point, but his point is what business is best at, innovating, changing, addressing risks, and searching for opportunities. And sustainable businesses are very good at that. And, and so I think that's, I just wanted to end on that sort of expression of, of optimism and say that's why, that's why we can do this together because there, are, there is a lot of power in this room. We can do, do good things, okay? So um, I think, well, uh, let's take one minute for any reflect. Let's take like a few seconds of quiet reflection. If you have something you absolutely feel you need to say at this point, let's say it. Otherwise, we're going to break up into our groups and do a little bit of talking to each other instead of just me talking at you.